Chapter Twelve of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Twelve. Bindle agrees to become a millionaire. One. As the intervals between Mr. Hearty's invitations for Sunday evenings lengthened, Bindle became a more frequent visitor at Dick Little's flat, where he could always be sure of finding jovial kindred spirits. Both Mrs. Hearty and Millie missed Bindle, and broadly hinted the fact to Mr. Hearty, but he enjoyed too well his Sunday evening hymns to sacrifice them on the altar of hospitality. Millie in particular resented the change. She disliked intensely the hymn singing, and she was greatly attached to Uncle Joe. At Dick Little's flat, Bindle found ample compensation for the loss of Mr. Hearty's very uncordial hospitality. Mrs. Bindle ain't at her best Sunday evenings, he had confided to Dick Little. Her soul seems to sort of itch a bit, and er not able to scratch it. He was always assured of a welcome at Chelsea, and the shout that invariably greeted his entrance flattered him. Different from old Artie's, good evening, Joseph, he would remark. I'd like Artie to meet this little lot. One Sunday evening, about nine o'clock, Bindle made his way round to the flat and found Dick Little alone with his brother Tom, who was spending the weekend in town. Bindle had not previously met Tom Little, who, however, greeted him warmly as an old friend. Perhaps I better be going, suggested Bindle tentatively, seeing as you're not a bit of it broke in dick little sit down mix yourself a drink there are the cigars bindle did as he was bid we were talking about gravy when you came in remarked tom little and very nice too with a cut from the joint and two veggies remarked bindle pleasantly dick little explained that gravy was the nickname by which mr reginald graves was known to his fellow undergraduates we're about fed up with him at joe's tom little added and who might joe be sir when he's at home and properly labelled inquired bindle at st joseph's college oxford where my brother is explained dick little in the course of the next half hour bindle learned a great deal about mr reginald graves who had reached oxford by means of scholarship and considered that he had suffered loss of caste in consequence his one object in life was to undo the mischief wrought by circumstances he could not boast of a long line of ancestry. In fact, on one occasion, when in a reminiscent mood, he had remarked, I had a grandfather. Had you, was the scathing comment of another man. The story had been retailed with great gusto among the men of St. Joseph's. Reginald Graves was a snob, which prompted him to believe that all men were snobs. Burke's peerage and Kelly's landed gentry were at once his inspiration and his cross. He used them constantly himself, looking up the ancestry of every man he met. He was convinced that his lack of family was responsible for his unpopularity. In his opinion, failing blood, the next best thing to possess was money, and he lost no opportunity of throwing out dark and covert hints as to the enormous wealth possessed by the Graves and Williams families, Williams being his mother's maiden name. His favorite boast, however, was of an uncle in Australia josiah williams had according to graves emigrated many years before fortune dogged his footsteps with almost embarrassing persistence until at the time that his nephew reginald went up to oxford he was a man of almost incredible wealth he owned mines that produced fabulous riches and runs where the sheep were innumerable graves was purposely vague as to the exact location of his uncle's sheep stations and on one occasion he spent an unhappy evening undergoing cross-examination by an Australian Rhodes scholar. However, he persisted in his story, and Australia was a long way off, and it was very unlikely that anyone would be sufficiently interested to unearth and identify all its millionaires in order to prove that Josiah Williams and his millions existed only in the imagination of his alleged nephew graves was a thin pale-faced young man with nondescript features and an incipient moustache furthermore he had what is known as a narrow dental arch which gave to his face a peevish expression when he smiled he bared two large front teeth that made him resemble a rabbit his hair was as colourless as his personality he was entirely devoid of imagination more as tom little phrased it 
what he lacked in divine fire he made up for in damned cheek he led a solitary life when his fellow undergraduates deigned to call upon him it was invariably for the purpose of a rag trade was the iron that had entered his soul he could never forget that his father was a grocer and provision merchant in a midland town his one stroke of good luck that is as he regarded it was that no one at st joseph's was aware of the fact had he possessed the least idea that the story of his forebears was well known at st joseph's it would have been to him an intolerable humiliation subservient almost fawning with his betters he was overbearing and insulting to his equals and inferiors since his arrival at st joseph's his scout had developed a pronounced profanity rumor had it that graves was not even above the anonymous letter but there was no definite evidence that those received by certain men at st joseph's found their inspiration in the brain of reginald graves nothing would have happened beyond increased unpopularity for graves had it not been for an episode out of which graves had come with anything but flying colours and which had procured for him a thrashing as anonymous as the letters he was suspected of writing he was a favourite with dr peter the master of st joseph's and this coupled with the fact that the master was always extremely well informed as to the things that the undergraduates would have preferred he should not know aroused suspicion one day travers asked graves to dinner and over a bottle of wine confided to him the entirely fictitious information that he was mixed up in a divorce case that would make the whole of oxford sit up next day he was sent for by dr peter who had heard a most disturbing rumour etc travers had taken the precaution of confiding in no one as to his intentions thus the source of dr peter's information was obvious the men of st joseph's were normal men broad of mind and brawny of muscle they had however their code and it was this code that graves had violated tom little had expressed the general view of the college when he said that graves ought to be soundly kicked and sent down now bindle remarked dick little you're a man of ideas what's to be done with gravy well sir that depends on x's it costs money to do most things in this world and it'll cost money to make mr gravy stew in his own juice how much might cost bindle paused to think might cost a matter of twenty or thirty quid to do it in style right oh out with it my merry bindle cried tom little travers and guggers alone would pay up for a good rag but it must be top hole mind yes said bindle with a grin it'd be top all right enough and bindle's grin expanded out with it man cried dick little don't you see we're aching to hear well said bindle if the x's was all right i might sort o go down and see ow my nephew mr gravy was getting on at with a whoop of delight tom little sprang up seized bindle round the waist and waltzed him round the room upsetting three chairs and a small table and finally depositing him breathless in his chair you're a genius old bindle dick we're out of it with the incomparable bindle dick little leaned back in his easy chair and gazed admiringly at bindle as he pulled with obvious enjoyment at his cigar course i never been a millionaire but i dessay i'd get through without disgracing myself the only thing that'd worry me i'd be having about half a gross of knives and forks for every meal and a dozen glasses but i'm open to consider anything that's going the only drawback remarked little would be the absence of the millions that would sort of be an obstacle admitted bindle after a pause dick little continued if you were to have your expenses paid with a new rig out and say five pounds for yourself do you think that for three or four days you could manage to be a millionaire don't you worry was bindle's response what about the real josiah williams dick little had inquired all fudge at least the millions are his brother replied the unspeakable reggie could not repudiate the relationship without giving the whole show away it's immense he mixed himself another whiskey and soda i'll talk it over with travers and guggers and wire you on wednesday good-bye bindle and he was gone that night bindle stayed late at little's flat and talked long and earnestly as he came away he remarked of course you'll remember sir that millionaires is rather inclined to be a bit dressy and i'd like to do the thing properly 
maybe with some paper inside i might even be able to wear a top hat two one tuesday afternoon when reginald graves entered his rooms he found awaiting him a copy of the oxford mail evidently sent from the office on the outside was marked see page three he picked up the packet examined it carefully and replaced it upon the table he was in all things studied having conceived the idea that to simulate a species of superior boredom was to evidence good breeding although alone he would not allow any unseemly haste to suggest curiosity having removed his hat and coat and donned a smoking jacket and turkish fez he felt that this gave him the right touch of undergraduate bohemianism he picked up the paper once more read the address and with studied indifference removed it could not be said that he tore off the wrapper he smoothed out the paper and turned to the page indicated where he saw a paragraph heavily marked in blue pencil that momentarily stripped him of his languorous self-control he read and re-read it looked round the room as if expecting to find some explanation and then read it again the paragraph ran a distinguished visitor australia has been brought very closely into touch with this ancient city by the munificence of the late mr cecil rhodes and his scheme of scholarships which each year brings to our colleges gifted scholars and to the playing fields and boats magnificent athletes it is interesting to note that we are shortly to have a visit from mr josiah williams the australian millionaire and philanthropist whose wealth is said to be almost fabulous and whose sheep runs are famous throughout the antipodes it would appear that we have often eaten of his mutton that is of the sheep that he has reared to feed the empire and now we are to have the privilege of welcoming him to oxford we understand that mr williams is to remain in our city for only a few days and that his main purpose in coming is to visit his nephew mr reginald graves of st joseph's college mr williams is we gather to be entertained by his nephew's fellow undergraduates at bungem's so famous for its dinners and suppers and it is mooted that the corporation may extend its hospitality to so distinguished a citizen of the empire thus are the bonds of empire cemented it would appear that mr josiah williams has engaged a suite of rooms at the sceptre where he will experience the traditional hospitality of that ancient english hostelry mr williams arrives to-morrow wednesday and we wish him a pleasant stay reginald graves gasped it was his rule never to show emotion and in his more studied moments he would have characterized his present attitude as ill-bred damn it was not his wont to swear his pose was one of perfect self-control he was as self-contained as a modern flat and about as small in his intellectual outlook he was just on the point of reading the paragraph for the fifth time when the door of his room burst open admitting tom little dick travers and guggers congrats gravy so the old boy's turned up cried little waving a copy of the oxford mail in graves's face joe's going to do him proud broke in travers you've seen the mail we'll give him the time of his life g g g g good egg broke in guggers so named because of his inability to pronounce a g without a preliminary gug gug accompanied by inconvenient splashings it had become customary at st joseph's to give guggers plenty of space in front whenever he approached a g tom little called it groom we're g g going to give him a g g g gorgeous time we'll have him drink from morn till dewy eve cried tom little and extra drunk at night oh my prophetic soul gravy where's your sense of hospitality cried travers reggie reluctantly produced whisky a siphon and some glasses by g g gosh cried guggers semi vaporizing the remains of a mouthful of whisky and soda won't it be a rag bless you g g gravy for having an uncle tom little explained that they had been to the sceptre and discovered that mr josiah williams would arrive by the three thirty train and that st joseph's was going down in a body to meet him graves of course would be there i have heard nothing said graves i i don't understand if he writes of course i'll go you'll jolly well g g go any old how or we'll carry you down cried guggers in a menacing voice looking down at graves from his six foot three of muscle and bone graves looked round him helplessly what was he to do 
could he disown his uncle should he explain that the whole thing was an invention and that he had never possessed a rich uncle in australia was it possible that by some curious trick there really was a josiah williams australian millionaire and philanthropist if these men would only go and leave him alone to think then suddenly there presented itself to his mind the other question what would josiah williams be like would he be hopelessly unpresentable would he humiliate him reginald graves and render his subsequent years at st joseph's intolerable how he wished these fellows would go end of chapter twelve read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com